First Peter chapter three, lesson thirteen. First Peter three verse eight through sixteen. But finally, all of you being like-minded, sympathetic, love as brethren, be compassionate, friendly, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that you are called for this purpose that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips speaking no deceit. Let him turn away from evil and let him do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Because the eyes of the Lord are upon the doers of right and his ears are open to their prayers but the Lord's face is against them doing evil. And who is he that will harm you if you likewise become followers of good? But and if you should suffer for the sake of doing what is right, happy are you. But be not afraid of them, neither be troubled. But put the Lord God in the place of honor, control in your hearts, and be ready always to give a defense to every man asking you concerning a word of hope in you with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conduct in Christ. 1 Peter 3, 8-11 provides just good advice that should grow out of the forgiveness of God, we ourselves are blessed with. Verse 8 But finally, all of you be like-minded, sympathetic, love as brethren, be compassionate, friendly, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that you are called for this purpose, that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips speaking no deceit. Let him turn away from evil, and let him do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. There is another reason for doing right. Verse 12. Because the eyes of the Lord are upon the doers of right and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord's face is against them doing evil. And who is he that will harm you if you likewise become followers of the good? But, and if you should suffer for the sake of doing what is right, happy are you. Jesus is not watching from afar, but has a close-up view of your heart from inside, and is never absent. Both of these words translated righteous and righteousness, respectively, in the King James Version, come from the Greek word diki, defined right, just, judicial, punishment, vengeance, sentence of punishment, nemesis and poena, the goddess of justice or vengeance. Verse 12 is the subroot word dikai os, defined as just, equitable, fair, righteous, absolutely upright, innocent. The word in verse 14 is a subroot, dikaya sunini, meaning fair and equitable dealing, justice, recititude, virtue, generosity, alms, pity, godliness, investiture with the attribute of righteousness, acceptance as righteous, justification, provision, or means for justification. When all this is boiled down, it just means right. It is either one who has done right or one who is judged right by virtue of paying the punishment for doing wrong. The concept can be clothed in big-sounding words, but it can be expressed as being, doing, or judged right. The first words of the remaining part of verse 14 hint at the thing that seems to trouble all of us, the fear of man, rejection, or violence. Yet the solution to this fear comes immediately after. Verse 14. 
But be not afraid of them, neither be troubled. But put the Lord God in the place of honor or control in your hearts. I have translated, the word usually translated sanctified, as put the Lord God in the place of honor or control. It is usually desirable to translate one word with another single word when possible. This is not possible unless we use a word like sanctify, which is often misdefined. The word translated sanctify, hagiasate, is a big religious word that, although we have come to accept it as an English word, it comes from the Greek root hagias, defined as separate from common condition and use, dedicated, hallowed, saints, that is, set apart ones, pure, righteous, holy. The Greek word here comes from the subroot hagiazo, and is defined in the lexicon as to separate, consecrate, cleanse, purify, sanctify, regard, or reverence as holy. These are words most often used concerning a lesser thing or person as God, setting us aside for his ownership and service to him, or when the Jews would consecrate the temple vessels. In this case, we are to sanctify God. We cannot set him aside to be holy, for he is holy, nor can we set him aside to do good, because he is the only one who is goodness itself. Nor do we want to separate him from his common condition or normal use or activity, because that would be to bring him down to our level. However, it is not that we do something ourselves in that we do good by ourselves to please him. That is not possible, and if we tried, it would be self-righteous sin and a rejection of our changed heart thinking and acceptance of God's grace. It is to set God in the place of honor in our hearts. It is often expressed as making God the Lord of our lives. Continuing on in verse 14, we have a command to do what you are doing now, learning God's word, so you can not only defend the gospel, but do so giving hope which you yourselves possess. This is important if we are not to break the third commandment. See my YouTube on commandment 3. If you are honest and sincere, then you should have no problem with your conscience or the slanders of men. Verse 15. And be ready always to give a defense to every man asking you concerning a word of hope in you with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conduct in Christ. Why do you believe in Jesus? That's the real question here. The answers can be, you're wrong, we are right. So often we try to argue people or teach people into salvation. But what we're talking about here is giving a reason for hope. This is what Jesus did for me, and he would do it for you if you let him. Conscience. It will become extremely important by the end of this chapter that we know exactly what Peter is talking about when he uses this word. It means just what we normally think of when we use the word conscience. The word is a subroot of the root sunoidea, and although it is never used in the New Testament, it means to share in the knowledge to be privy to, to be conscious, to have a clear conscience. The subroot used here is sunodesis, and is defined in the lexicon as consciousness, present idea, persisting notion, impression of reality, conscience, inward faculty of moral judgment, inward moral and spiritual frame. Put simply, it is the inward voice that accuses or excuses everything we do. We may judge others from the same database, 
but this is about what we do and how we feel about it. Although it is a judgment on our part, it is not how God sees, accuses, or excuses us, but it is our assessment of ourselves, which may include what we think God thinks.